Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Markus Gräfen. I welcome you uh, in the behalf of the ESU online school. We will have a webinar tonight together. Um, it's, the title is The Use of Prompts in the Evaluation of Robotic uh, Radical Prostatectomy. Um, yeah, I welcome you. I hope you, you had a nice day and uh, we have some, some points of discussion later on. First of all, I will give, give a 40 minute presentation to you. Um, after that, we have about 20 minutes to, to, to talk a little bit. It's via the chat. So if you want to ask something, just write your questions down and I, I, will, I will read them out, uh, pick some of the questions and uh, discuss them with you and explain to you. Um, important for you is that you get one CME credit point from um, uh, for the for answering the questionnaires. You have to know that you get the questionnaire by mail by tomorrow. So don't be impatient if you don't get any feedback this night. Um, tomorrow you will get the the questionnaire, and I hope I can make my presentation clear enough that you all are able to answer the questions. I have no conflicts of interest with my talk, nothing that actually influenced what I'm, what I'm talking to you, what I'm explaining to you. Fortunately, we had the luck that Intuitive is uh, sponsoring this uh, webinar. Um, uh, but as I said, again, no, no in conflicts of interest. Three topics are the subject of my talk tonight. Um, the three topics are what are prompts? What do we mean with that? And, and uh, how do we use them, especially in localized prostate cancer? The metrics of RAP, and I think that's a special constellation, um, the, the robotic surgery, the patient reported outcome measurements, the PROMS, and my idea of um, how the future might be with the measuring of, of surgical quality. So these three points I would like to explain to you. So first subject, what are PROMS? patient reported outcome measures. Everyone knows this uh, abbreviation. I think it's not only used for, for localized prostate cancer and by far not only used for robotic radical prostatectomy. It's actually used in, in almost every field of evaluation of treatment issues and options. Uh, for example, you will not be not seeing any, any study on, on one of the new drugs in prostate cancer that is not as well uh, supplemented with quality of life measurements. So this is something like a, a very crucial part of our evaluation of medication and treatment. The difference certainly is that, that this part of the documentation is done by the patient and it's not done by us, the treating physicians. And it's always um, based on quality of life questionnaires. It's, it's kind of supplements objective measures. So we can certainly have these things like cancer specific survival, metastasis free survival and so forth, things that we measure but this is combined then and supplemented with the judgments of the patients like the quality of life. I want to talk about localized prostate cancer and uh, it's very important for me that you get out of this talk that there's a, a really important initiative um, that is ongoing and it's called the International Consortium of Health Outcome Measurement or ITRUM. And uh, this is a, a consortium of um, Harvard, um, Harvard University Boston Consulting Group and Karolinska Institute. And the goal of, of uh, this consortium is to, to build a new benchmark for, for measuring, measuring value in, in um, healthcare and in treatment options. So it might sound a little bit abstract, but um, this is working quite well. Um, I will show you the example for localized prostate cancer. And the idea about that is that the value for a patient by a treatment is the outcome that you achieve and certainly uh, divided by the cost of delivering. And for, for understanding what the patient considers a good outcome, we certainly need outcome measurement. And um, this is uh, uh, Michael Porter, the picture here, he's the leader of, of the ITRUM initiative. And his statement is always, outcome measurements is the most powerful way to, to change and implement things in the healthcare system. <clears throat> One of his statements, which impressed us very much when he gave an interview in Germany in a magazine was that it's unethical to his opinion to not perform outcome measurement. And I think that uh, Mr. Porter is right. So what is the idea of ITRUM? The idea of ITRUM is that the needs, the wishes, the hopes of the patients are at the center of attention. And what he emphasizes is that outcome measurement must be systematic, 
must you always use the same same uh, question years it's the same point in time it must be standardized it must be risk adapted otherwise it's, it's really difficult to compare outcomes it must be transparent in the way that it's reproducible and people can just deal with this data you're you're producing and certainly it should be internationally comparable so these are the the um kind of prerequisites that uh, michael porter states for outcome measurement what what is necessary validated questionnaires we have seen in the in the earlier days so many publications for example on potency and continents without the use of validated questionnaires i think the time is over you will not get any paper accepted anymore when you're not using validated questionnaires you must as well otherwise it's completely useless uh, obtain a baseline measurement you must define for such a standard set of quality measurement uh, the time points for the measurement it must be practical you have to think that patients have to sit down before the treatment and after the treatment and, and fill in this question use and must be let's say motivated enough to to send them back to you so they shouldn't be too awkward too long so forth it's kind of a let's say mixture between being precise but as well making it um, nice for the patient and ideally, and I think that is something important really in, and that happened in localized prostate cancer, that it covers various treatment options. In 2013, we started the initiative from Hamburg. It was actually Professor Huland who um, got in touch with the ITRIM initiative. The ITRIM initiative was at those days already, um, had already created um, standard measuring sets for cardiac disease for hip replacement and so forth. And um, so Hulan had the idea to, to um, approach this organization to get something started for localized prostate cancer. And, and it finally worked out, and this is a product. Um, we, we did almost the, the whole work in, in almost one year, I must say. Um, we gathered together many people, many stakeholders from various uh, treatment approaches, radiation oncologists, for example, Anthony Miku was involved, uh, surgeons like Ash Tavari, uh, people who represented active surveillance, for example, Chris Bangma, that Briganti was in that group. We have patient representatives, and uh, all together we created this data set with um, consensus meetings, telephone conferences, and as I said, this is a product. What is it measuring? It's measuring there in, in various treatment options, complications, oncology data, and functional data. So with this data set, with this patient reported outcome measurement data set, you can measure the quality of active surveillance, of prostatectomy, of external beam radiation, brachytherapy, and as well, because you have to sometimes combine that androgen deprivation. You see acute, acute complications. This is this uh, uh, sector here. Major surgical complications are measured, radiation complications are measured, urinary incontinence, frequency, bowel irritation, sexual function, and so forth. And these are the survival and disease control um, parts of the questionnaire. What does the actual uh, criteria measure? Toxicities and complications within the first six months, and then urinary incontinence, irritation, bowel symptoms, um, using the EPIC 26 short form. So that is the basis for the ITRIM criteria. This is something of an important issue because uh, you have to know that there are so many questionnaires out uh, these days, but uh, finally this group and the ITRIM consortium agreed on the EPIC 26 as the Z standard uh, short form basis for our measurements. And the oncological outcomes, as you can imagine, certainly overall survival, cancer specific, metastasis free, and biochemical recurrence free survival. What you need to obtain certainly are baseline information, clinical and pathological information, and the comorbidities to make it comparable um, in between the treatment options. This is the publication. Uh, we published that standard set in um, 2015 in uh, European Neurology, but you can certainly download that from the homepage of iTunes if you want to look at this brochure and use the questionnaires. Um, just to give you an example how that works, for example, for regular prostatectomy, you have a patient here, you have the baseline uh, diagnostics, then the surgery, and then as we said, after six months, 
you take the pathologic risk factors, you take the acute complication, this is the blue part here, you can always see what it means, so what you measure at what point in time, and that's important. It's standardized what instrument you use at what point in time, and the patient reported outcome measures. And then again, after one year, two years, three years, up to 10 years, that is the, um, that is the idea of that. And you can cover like every other treatment option as well. For example, a patient who's undergoing active surveillance, you have the baseline data, six months of a post-diagnosis. You again take the patient reported outcome measurements like the quality of life after one year again. And then uh, you, when the patient decides, for example, to undergo radiation therapy, it's initiated. And then after six months, if you see here, six months after surgery, now six months after radiation, you take the complications and um, the patient reported outcome measurements again. So the idea is always that we it was kind of a balance between um, covering radiation therapy and the complications and, and uh, surgery and, and the other options as well. So why, why is that important for robotic radical prostatectomy? And I think that with the PROMS, the, the standard of measuring the quality for the patient we have with the robot and with robotic surgery, something at hand that can definitely improve our, our surgical quality. And our surgical quality, the end point, and that's why I'm saying that, are the prongs, what the patient really experiences. So uh, robotic surgery is actually developed to, to improve surgery itself. So the device was made to make surgery better. But um, what, what is clear is that the evaluation of surgical performance is much easier with the robot than it has been before. It's much easier than in open surgery where you don't take a video. It's much easier than in conventional laparoscopy, uh, for example, where you cannot take uh, performance metrics during the surgery. Therefore, we have a unique situation in robotic surgery. And uh, with this surgical performance evaluation, you can certainly look how good a surgeon is how proficient he is, but as well, you can, you can evaluate the performance with the prompts and see what is actually coming and what's, what's, what's going on for the patient finally. So when I look at my history, I was trained as an as a open surgeon um, where it's kind of a black box. You're there with your, with your surgeon who trains you. Then you take over at some point in time. You have your assistant doctor. No one's really seeing what you're doing. I'm, uh, except for yourself and your assistant, not even the nurse usually at the table. And now with robotics, it's a completely trackable, transparent process um, that can be used for evaluation and is used for evaluation and quality assurance programs. So what is, the, what is good performance? And I think we can talk hours about what is good and what is the definition of good surgery. I think we have to get away from only thinking that it's caseload. Certainly caseload is something that gives you a lot of experience and, and dexterity and these things, but it's not caseload alone, certainly. It's good performance, skillful handling of the, of the um, robot. You can track these, uh, the movement that you're doing with, uh, during robotic surgery, like instrument motion tracking, camera movement, third arm swap, and so forth. So you get something like a score or, or a number how, how skillful someone uses the robot. The next step, or let's say another way of looking at, at quality are the um, global evaluated assessment of robotic surgery or the abbreviation is GEARS. With this, again, you look at a video and then judge how skillful someone is. It's not like tracking your movements, but it's something you, you decide as someone who is viewing a video in a, in a, a standardized scale. I think the future and the most important development we, we are seeing is the so-called proficiency-based progression. And the idea behind that, I will show you a publication that you just had on that in, in December, is that um, we're not looking at, let's say, the number or dexterity, but we define what good surgery is and then judge whether the, the surgeon reaches this goal of the criteria of good surgery and we define what errors are during the case and uh, allow a certain amount of, of errors to, um, or and, and certainly a cutoff where someone can be stated to be able to do a good or a bad surgery. In the case I'm gonna show you is, is certainly no sparing radical prostatectomy. 
And finally, I think the last step is certainly that we have this metrics that we developed, how good is the surgery combined with what the patient experiences. And what I mean is like that we don't judge whether the, the nerve sparing looks nice, but we judge whether the patient became potent after the surgery or not. And that is the combination with the prompts. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the um, um, things that are already published in the, in the literature. I talked about GEARS, the evalua uh, evaluative assessment. So this is one of the publications that looked at, uh, one of the first publications that actually came out from that. And uh, it was developed on, on robotic radical prostatectomies, but not only on robotic radical uh, prostatectomies, it's, it's applicable. What I mean is that the, the, the skillful uh, handling of the robot, the familiarity with the system is measured here. And what you see is things like videos have to be, be uh, watched at, death perception, for example, if it's constantly overshoots the target, that's only one point, or is the, the, the uh, death perception very good, accurately directs instruments, by manual dexterity, is someone just using his, his uh, right hand and not using his left hand? Third arm swap, things like that, force sensitivity, efficiency of the movement. So the better you are, again, judged by, by someone who's watching the video, putting a number in these scales and then adding these numbers up, the more, the higher the score, the more dexterous is the, uh, is the surgeon. So one thing is skillfulness. The other thing is certainly what, what happened to the patient. And uh, it has been shown that these skills certainly or, or, or correlate, let's put it that way, with early continence. Everyone would expect that, but it has been shown. And uh, beside this global evaluative tool, what I've shown you, there are certainly other, other assessment tools, for example, the PACE, prostatectomy assessment and competency evaluation, the RAISE, judging the anastomosis. And these are step and procedure specific tools to, to look at the quality of parts or the whole procedure. As I said before, for judging this and applying this, you need someone who is reviewing the video and this is certainly a source of variance. So someone can look at the video and say, oh, this is pretty good or this is decent or not so good. The other one might like it and there's certainly a, a difference in the judgment and it's very time consuming. I don't know whether you've done these things, uh, reviewing a video is yeah, yeah, at, at least as, uh, as time consuming as, as doing the surgery. So what are the ways to, to um, be more efficient in reviewing this? And I think a very interesting idea, which has been shown for, for other procedures as well, is the crowdsourcing. And uh, I found this fascinating that um, it's possible today that you put a, a video um, to give it to lay people who then assess the video and get a scaling there. And this certainly might be um, make it, makes it faster and, and actually cheaper if you have to pay someone, an expert to review video. So crowdsourcing is a new tool for evaluation. And I want to show you this publication here. And uh, these were based on videos where that were given to lay people and to surgical experts. And it was correlated to the automatic performance metric. That means to the movement, the skillfulness, could someone who is watching a video, uh, when he says it's a good video, a good surgery, does this correlate with a good performance metrics that was automatically taken by the Da Vinci Lawyer in, um, in this study. And then it was compared to experts and the, the um, as I said, it's faster and cheaper. And uh, the correlation of the scores by the crowd was then correlated with the expert scores. This is, you don't have to look at the table just to show you all these correlation coefficients. And the interesting thing is that, that someone who is, uh, who is naive in these things has not seen, is not an expert in the video uh, reviewing, that they can differentiate nuances of robotic maneuvers. Um, when they use this scale, when they look at the, the um, assessment scores, and uh, they were certainly not as good as a uh, experienced surgeon in the, in the way of understanding so many nuances of the, of the uh, procedure, but clearly the scores they had correlated with the um, performance metrics and were pretty much in line with the experts. So that was, uh, that's, I think, is a very interesting observation 
So uh, lay people, yes, they can discriminate surgical skills when you give them a tool to do that. And this is a new source of new for cost-effective, fast, accurate workforce. Um, and I think it's a very interesting development. Again, only possible because we track all the videos on the, with the robot and um, have the chance to, to review them at any point in time. The next step, and I think that is, is very fascinating really, is um, that you can then certainly use machine learning and artificial intelligence, I think that's a part for the future, um, for evaluating surgical quality. And I think we are just at the beginning of this development. But I want to show you one, one paper by Andrew Hung's group, which uh, this group is doing an amazing work on, on uh, uh, evaluating surgical quality. What they did here, they combined machine learning, like artificial intelligence, to develop algorithms by the computer, and correlated them with uh, um, or based on uh, um, the automated performance metrics. And the idea was that well, within the study was that the, um, the, the skills, the, the performance of the surgeon with the, with the robot was correlated to the length of stay. Does someone have complications, must stay longer in the hospital, can we take the catheter out earlier? These were the endpoints. And then it was looked at the automatic performance metrics tracked by the WG logger. And uh, it was interesting to see that an algorithm is able, just from the movements, the way people uh, use the robot to predict with a pretty high accuracy whether the patient will later have complications or not, which means he needs to stay longer or not. So with a 88.5% accuracy, it could be said that the patient can be discharged in time. Um, which I found really impressive. What I think is interesting as well, and, and you might have this in your, in your mind when you next watch videos, um, that the most relevant uh, automatic performance metric was the camera manipulation. So in this study, like short, uh, often movements of the camera were very much predicting good outcome. What I told you before, and this is another step, and this is about training, but as well as uh, evaluation of, of surgical outcome is um, proficiency-based progression. Video reviews and uh, gears have shown that that correlates with the outcome of lab. But the, the thing that is not yet been defined, it has been defined in this paper I want to introduce to you, is what is, um, what is good quality and what is a correct RAP. And the correct RAP, and I say we had uh, meetings with uh, Peter Wicklow and Alex Motri and uh, Tony Gallagher, who is an expert in proficiency-based progression. Many weekends last, last year, or let's say in 2019, um, we spent to develop a, a, a metrics that allow us to judge a surgical video with a benchmark saying that this is a well done standard nurse pairing radical prostatectomy. So first of all, for this thing, you need to develop and consensus with RAP experts, a reference a radical prostatectomy. And um, then you need someone certainly that makes a consensus on that. And, and this is agreed by your peers that this is a way how you should do a radical prostatectomy. So in this study, we published in the British Journal just in December, we uh, divided the nerve sparing radical prostatectomy into uh, 12 phases of the procedure, like trochal placement, drop of the bladder, based on the anterior approach, um, whatever, bladder neck dissection, apical dissection, nerve sparing right, left, nerve sparing right. We defined 81 steps and described them, and it was very I would say sometimes painful uh, to, to understand how someone like Tony Gallagher, who's a psychologist, wants to make it precise what is, for example, not too much tension on the nerves. How do you describe that? How can you put that in a scale that someone else can use this scale to see whether this is a good or not a good um, uh, nerve spring procedure? And we defined, and that is very important, errors. So things you should not do. You use monopolar coagulation when you when you um, do your uh, nerve sparing procedure, for example, do much, too much traction and all these things. It must be defined so that everyone can understand that and judge that. And then, uh, as well, critical error things you should definitely not do 
if you do these things, this is not a good nurse pairing procedure. You can certainly have to, to define the level of how many errors are tolerated until you say, yes, this is, this is a good one. Uh, this is not a good one, not acceptable. And uh, the whole idea about proficiency-based progression is that you, it's not about repeating all the things, it's achieving a goal, achieving a good surgery defined by this criteria. We, uh, after we define this criteria in many, many weekends, we wrote this down and then so you had to, as I said, a consensus meeting on that. We did that on the Eris meeting in Marseille uh, two years ago, three years ago, and uh, reached a high consensus on the, on the definitions. And the next step certainly was then with this scale, with this metrics we developed, uh, we assessed videos. So there were 12 videos from experts and non-experts like Novi surgeons. And uh, the scale, the metrics were applied and uh, we could see that, which is good, more procedural steps were done by the experienced surgeons, a more delicate procedure, and uh, that less errors, 72% uh, less errors were done by expert surgeons compared to uh, novice surgeons. So what we could see then is that these metrics can uh, differentiate between an expert and someone who has not done that very often. This is certainly only one step. One interesting thing is um, what was the most important phases of differentiating the experienced and non-experienced surgeon with the most errors and uh, made by the novice compared to an expert, and that was the nerve strain dissection. I don't want to go too much into detail, but these are um, the 12 phases that we finally developed. In these phases, like endopelvic fascia incision, bladder neck dissection, there were differences between the novices and the expert. But as I said, the nerve sparing was the part of the procedure that allowed best to, to differentiate between an expert and a non-expert. So what will be the future of, of uh, measuring surgical quality? Um, the, what I want to, what I think will come next, and we have started a project like that, that we until now have the ability to, to judge dexterity and, and skillful performance, as I said before. And this was certainly used to, to say, oh, this is, this is good, this is good quality. We know now that dexterity and good outcome usually is certainly correlates quite well, but it might not be the same. So you can be very skillfully destroy the sphincter muscle, for example, or use a technique that is not transporting to, to good continence or good potency. And I think with the PROMS, the combination of what we get from the robot and with PROMS, we are at the, at the point where we can correlate that. So we have to think get kind of rid of our traditional assumptions of our own so that we, we think as a surgeon, this is how things are done well and judge the next or peers with our expectation. It must change to the end point. We judge the quality of the surgery to the outcome. And I want to show you one, one project that we've just started. And this is together with the Aussie Institute under the, the um, guide and the lead of Alex Motri and Tony Gallagher. There we want to correlate. And you see here, I put this together. These are 120 videos we have from the Martini Clinic where we had the baseline um, ITRIM criteria prior to surgery. And uh, then the criteria after the surgery. So this is half year and one year after surgery and uh, have patients who are potent and impotent and uh, we will now uh, evaluate our metrics with the in respect to uh, outcome status before video status after surgery and uh, to see how it works. We have you not know, yet started with it. We've defined and, uh, the videos uh, and this will be certainly the next step and uh, I think it, it will work out fine. The whole thing is about recognizing important steps and maneuvers during the surgery, avoiding errors that impact outcome, the judgment of surgery quality on base, based on matters uh, on outcomes that matters to the patient. And I think the, the whole idea when we talk about the future is certainly with the with uh, pattern recognition that will be introduced by artificial intelligence and machine learning. At some point in time, I think we're far away of being there, we will be able to use the videos and uh, understand, let's say, 
ways of how a surgery is done well, maybe beyond of what we expect. And maybe the artificial intelligence will giving us a new insight by reviewing the videos, having the endpoint of, of good outcome. And maybe in the future, we will have something like uh, in, in the uh, new upcoming robotic systems, um, uh, an artificial intelligence that might block a surgeon when he's doing a mistake, uh, destroying a nerve when imaging is, is combined with that and so forth. So I think there's, we're just at the beginning of an amazing development like a GPS in your car, I think we will in not too many years uh, away from now have things like GPS for, for radical prostatectomies and surgery in general. The other thing is, um, so this was based on the robotic surgery and, and patient reported outcomes. And I wanna show you another initiative that is based again on PROMS. And uh, I wanna show you one publication. And I th thought it was interesting to our subject tonight because it's um, the first study that patients uh, organize. So it's not only us who are giving the patient the prompts, it's now patients starting to evaluate treatments as well. And uh, this was one of the so-called game-changing sessions on the EAU meeting where André Deschamps, he's one of the leaders of the patient representative groups in Europe, uh, presented this study. Um, the idea of that was that he says, we, want, we see all these data in the publications and this might not um, necessarily transport to what we see in daily life, all these nice randomized trials might not reflect reality. So what they did is a 20 minute online, uh, online survey, EPIC 26, ERTC, um, uh, quality of life questionnaires, they covered about 3000 patients that were treated with prostate cancer in Europe. 24 countries and collected their data. It's like a longitudinal study they performed. And you see here one comparison, which I like very much. So what did this, uh, what did the patients do? It's patients initiated, patients driven, completely done by patients. I wanna show you one graph. The whole study was actually published in December in European Neurology Focus. And you see here, this is a sexual function um, after uh, radiation therapy reported in the literature. You see the publications here and the decline of sexual function. And you see that it's overestimated and it was one of the key messages here from the, the patient representatives, the, the uh, sexual function after radiation therapy, because this was what they measured in their peers, what the patients reported outside trials, which was worse than that. And the other comparison, which I thought was very interesting as well, they compared it to the PROTECT-T study that, that we all know. We know that the PROTECT-T study was uh, done uh, on, on early and uh, you know, early intermediate and, and low risk prostate cancer to compare active surveillance, radiation therapy, and, uh, and surgery, always good outcome, as we know. And then it was focused on quality of life issues. And uh, what the patient representatives found in their peers outside such a trial is that the quality of life in active surveillance was the best and radical prostatectomy was pretty much like in the trial shown. This is the red bar, and this is um, the, the sexual function. And, you, and interesting that for radiation therapy, the sexual function was worse in reality compared to radical prostatectomy. And you see this is in the study, in the PROCTT study, and this is in the, in the real life. And um, the discussion was in, the, in this uh, presentation that it's worthwhile to, to do this um, reality measurements from the patients and they're keen to, to keep on going with that to kind of um, scale what we see in randomized trials. So the take home message of that was um, of that study measured on the base and the prompts is that the urinary incontinence rate was the highest in radical prostatectomy, but sexual function different to the, to the randomized trials was worst in radi after radiation therapy. Fatigue and insomnia very much impacted the quality of life and the best quality of life was seen in an under, uh, after active surveillance. Again, results of studies in the real world might not necessarily be comparable. Finally, there's one other initiative I just want to raise your attention to, because I think this is the next way of using the, the um, data we get by PRONS. And it's um, the PCO-CRV trial. It's prostate cancer outcome compare and reduce variations. So this idea is that the action criteria are used 
and this is already ongoing. We have participated with many other clinics in Germany uh, using the ITRIM standard set. And this will allow us in the future um, uh, to compare clinics in between and the outcome of clinics between uh, clinics. The idea is certainly not to, let's say, punish someone, but to understand and recognize uh, factors that might be connected with worse or better outcome and uh, to see whether this can be helping to, to change the structure or do other thing, things different in order to improve quality. So this is the end of my talk. I hope I could show you that patient reported outcome measurements are now part of the, the daily life that we should all have in our uh, clinical validation. My take home message is, it's very important that you measure patient reported outcomes. You have the standard set at hand. It's free and available. I think it is only a question of time. And at least in Germany, you need to use this ITRIM criteria standard set in order to get your prostate cancer cer uh, center certified by the German Cancer Society. So there's nothing we can say, oh, this is nice to have. I think it will be compulsory in the future, at least if you, if you wanna have something like a, a certificate for your uh, cancer center, it, it's very, very helpful for looking at your own quality. The studies, like I showed you the PCO trial, comparing internationally are ongoing. So I think patients will look at that, will be aware of that. And you have to know, for example, that the PCO trial is, is funded by Movember, so by the patients themselves. We have seen that patients are now taking things in their own hands. They are doing their own studies looking, uh, using PROMS. Um, with the robot, I think we have the chance to, to use all these uh, data we achieved from, from PROMS and correlate it better than before with our surgical technique and our surgical behavior, because we can track the videos. We might be in the future able to, to use artificial intelligence to recognize good surgery. And um, um, finally, I think uh, we have now at hand and develop metrics that allow us to identify good quality. And again, with artificial intelligence, it might be less time consuming and very easy to apply. And I think that would change the world, how we train people, how we evaluate the quality of surgery. Um, I hope you find this interesting. And um, I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm certainly happy to take questions. Thanks a lot. So I will go. Okay, so I have questions here. I have a, a question here from, from Dr. Gombos. How can PROMS help and should be implemented if a novice surgeon has only the possibility to perform just a maximum of 25 prostatectomies a year? That is a very good question, but um, you, if you if you think about, um, let's say, the the tradition of of the more you do, the better you are. I think that's clearly that there's a strong correlation with that. Um, but on the other hand, you can use this standard set for judging yourself. So how would you? I mean, certainly you get the feedback from your patient saying, "Oh, this guy has a continence problem." Maybe you're referring a urologist. Uh, uh, mirrors that back to you or the patient is complaining. But uh, this gives you at hand a possibility to, to rate yourself. So I think um, it's very useful even if you have a low, low case volume. I think even more or at least the same thing uh, useful as with a high volume uh, surgery, you can lose it in, in low volume. It's just a standardization of what you think is is, is good. There's another question from Dr. La Pera. What does it mean metrics? Metrics are measurements. Metrics are, are parameters that, that, are, that you can scale, where you get a number from, or how you can measure quality. That is the definition of metrics. 
Then I have another question. What is your experience in Hamburg with patients completing the questionnaires? Are they still motivated a couple of years after treatment? And how do you keep them motivated? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, I may say that, that we are struggling with that, absolutely. And, and therefore, I thank you for that question. But I think that there are a couple of ways of, of um, yeah, keeping them on track. First of all, we have, um, we tell the patient at the beginning, when we take the baseline uh, evaluation with a nice uh, letter before, the, before they got admitted, uh, how important that is. And they, they benefited from the knowledge that we got with, because other patients before them filled in these questionnaires. And um, then certainly on the ward, they, they are motivated again. We have people just like, like on our outcome study group, students who were, if the patient hadn't filled in the questionnaire, the baseline questionnaire, they get uh, approached so that we get as much complete data as possible. And then the, the next questionnaire is sent out automatically. And that is something if you want to, to uh, implement that, try to automize as much as possible because in your clinical uh, day, you will forget things, you will have lots of work to do. So if you don't standardize, automatize things with uh, like, uh, uh, for example, automatic reminders, if a patient doesn't answer, it, you must do these things. How can you motivate them? What we are doing, and that was Harvey Kulan's idea, and I think that was a very good idea. We sent the, every, every patient who is participating in that, we tracked the patients and we sent them at the end of the year, a, a letter, certainly automated, dear Mr. So-and-so, thank you for giving them. This is what we've done with your data. And then we summarize for the patients who participated in the questionnaires, what we did with, them, with their data. And, and people like that, the patients like that. They feel kind of a responsibility of, of um, yeah, giving back something um, for, other, for, uh, for their peers. Oh, do you define problems only in Rob? Uh, Dr. Matzdag is asking that. No, I, I think, uh, so the, the problems you're using, you can use them for everything. And I showed you the iTunes criteria I mean, everything like a localized prostate cancer, you use the standardized questionnaires and you can use them for active surveillance, for, for radiation therapy brachy. And that was one of the parts when we developed this, this patient reported outcomes for localized prostate cancer that we, that we balanced the, the, the differences in side effects. For example, after um, radiation therapy, you don't wanna look at side effects, let's say six weeks after that, which is the most important phases for the surgery. So there must be a balance of not being too close to the, to the treatment to cover the, the later toxicity of the radiation therapy, and, uh, but not too far away, otherwise you might not cover the surgical complications. So no, you can use the PROM for whatever you want. If you talk about, about the metrics we developed for judging the robotic radical prostatectomy, yes, these metrics, I showed you the publication in uh, December in the British Journal, these are only applicable for, for a robotic radical prostatectomy. So I'm gonna go through the questions. How do you technically collect PROMS data from the patients? Email paper version. Oh, thank you very much. Bernard Raller is, is asking that. Um, good question. At the beginning we did it with, with paper, but then we are overwhelmed. We have in Hamburg about 2,500 radical prostatectomies per year and we, we are contacting all the patients on a yearly basis. So we're now sending out about 30,000 questionnaires per year annually. And uh, that means over 2,000 per month. So you, you, we definitely decided to go away from paperwork. We're still doing that with our like old patients who are not that familiar. We're having this database for 25 years. So we have quite old patients who don't like the internet, but I highly recommend to you that you do it all with automized questionnaires that the patient just gets a link and answers the questions, sends the questionnaire back, because otherwise, yeah, it's, it's difficult. If you have not such a high caseload and you might not have the ability to have a computer specialist in your, in your clinic, then do it with paper. Giuseppe La Pera, what have been so far the cost for prom for prostate cancer? I, I, I hope I understand your question right. The costs for, for patient reported outcome measurements is, is 
certainly the cost that you need to implement it in your clinic. There's nothing like you can, you can go to the homepage, you can, uh, from iTron, you can take that criteria, you can print that out, give it to the patient. It's completely up to you. This is your work time. If you have something like a data manager, we have a couple of data managers. Yes, you have to pay their salary. Uh, you have to do a, a database where you put that in. Some using like Excel files, others using more advanced certainly um, data bases with automatic reminders. These are the costs that are generated. The question is pretty good because I think sometimes it's, for example, in Germany, the, the, the current government is kind of um, asking for quality measurements, but on the other hand, not um, talking about the budget that, that, you will, that you need for that. We will not yet have something like an official budget, for example, in our clinic, Martini Clinic, we are, we are financing that. We convinced our financial director that this is important for us, for the surgical quality, and he's now willing to, to, to give some money, to donate some money to our um, uh, outcome uh, study group. So we get not finance that. You must um, see how it works. We as well use grants for that. That's another issue. I see the question from Corinne Tillier. I hope I pronounced it right. Prompts are used to improve surgery, but to motivate patients to answer quality of life questionnaires, you need more interaction feedback with patients in our clinic setting. Do you use the answers of prompts to communicate with patients? Sometimes we use it, as I said, in this, in this yearly letter to our patients, thanking them for, for being so nice, uh, helping us to improve. Um, the other thing is um, certainly that we motivate them on the on the ward, but um, yeah, this is something like you have to you have to be on track. Feedback to the patients, yes. If the patient is not good, like we have this the first evaluation, this is out at the iTrum. This is just for us internally. It's the one we call it one week letter, and if a patient is bad on that, if he has lots of pets that he's using. We call them. That's something we obliged us, the surgeon, that you that the patient sees that it's not just filling a questionnaire on one cares and it's nice statistics in the background. But if a patient is not very good, the good ones we don't call. But those who have problems, we call them. And very often it's I think rather relieving for the surgeon because when you get the letter, it's already another week gone. Uh, and and usually the patient is much better. So and it's very important for the patient that he understands that that you care about him by just just call him and, and see how he's doing. Maybe have some advice for, for to get better and so forth. Um, Jean-Gabriel Zoumé, I'm from industry. Would you say the date may suggest that the, the, the data may suggest that complication rates are underestimated? Yes, I think, <laughs> excellent question. Yes, I think this is something that was certainly discussed. I, sh I showed you the game-changing session uh, at the EAU meeting. That was certainly discussed uh, on that meeting. It was um, André Deschamps, the, the patient representative guy, and the um, and the other uh, discussant was um, Stephen Genot. And yeah, they discussed that. And I think it's I I'm not I'm not surprised about that because usually the uh, the studies that are out there. Uh, are based on, on big data. So big data means um, experienced surgeons usually because you need to do a lot of surgeries to create big data. So I think it's all not necessarily the same as we discussed, but uh, certainly I think that that is like kind of a positive selection what we see in the literature compared on what is going on in real life. What, um, again, Dr. Tillier asked what the response rate for, for the prompts is. Um, at the beginning, it's, it's about 80% together with the reminders. So what we do, for example, when we, we send the patient out a questionnaire, and we have an automatic system that, that uh, tracks whether the patient has put in his data or not. If after a certain amount of time, which is one month, there are no data filled in by the patient, and then he gets an automatic reminder. If he doesn't answer after that, we leave him in peace. But then, as we said, after one year, we'd ask again, unless the patient says, I don't want to be contacted anymore. If he doesn't answer, it gets a reminder. And then we leave him in peace. After two years, we ask him. And so we have altogether about a response rate of about 80%. 
So, but you have to keep on track. It's not if you if you don't react, if you don't resend it, the the question is you might lose a lot of patience and a lot of a lot of information. Oscar Bergengren asks, hi, how do you differentiate between the different steps of prostatectomy, nerve sparing, anastomosis on the outcome defined by PROM in your upcoming study? Um, thank you for the excellent presentation. Thank you, Oscar. That's, that's motivating. Thank you. Um, different steps, nerve sparing of the outcome defined. Okay, good. So what we do in this study, so as I said, like in the present, in the publication, we saw that the nerve sparing part was the, the part which could best uh, differentiate between experienced and non-experienced surgeons. So we will, we will certainly judge all the 120 videos that we have because we can do other projects with that. But for that, looking we, uh, first project, we want to look at potency rates. So we have uh, um, half of the videos roughly are patients who were impotent even one year after surgery. They all had bilateral nerve sparing, were potent before. And the other group of patients were potent six months after surgery. So we have a very good and a very bad outcome. And we use, we want to focus first on the, on the nerve sparing procedure and uh, see whether yeah, we can differentiate this with our, with our metrics, like not too much tension, carefully the prostate move, not the nerve uh, bundle. And if you go through all these little steps, uh, you have definitions, what is good and what is not good, and then you can see whether it's fulfilled or not, and then you can see whether it's correlating with the outcome. Um, Luis Oestergaard, do you see a better patient involving in the treatment when using PROM actively? And do you see a better understanding of the disease and symptoms? Absolutely. I think, uh, very good question. Um, Absolutely, and, uh, and what you picked up in your question is the whole idea about the ITUM criteria. And I think that is based on a little bit of different thinking. I wanna give you one example. When we do surgery, I think everyone is, is pretty proud of himself or herself when you're taking lots of lymph nodes and lymph node dissection. So, oh, I've taken 30 lymph nodes, they're all negative, or maybe it's one positive. This is outcome that is something important for us, but not necessarily for the patient. The patient might have other, other issues or does definitely have other issues. How can I perform my life after the surgery? Uh, will I be potent surgery? Will I be continent? So I think it's a bit, bit uh, uh, different. And I think that you definitely understand the patient's needs better if you look at the problems. And I can tell you that that um, having a database and getting a reflection of your, of your data that you produce makes you definitely more humble when you see that even if you're very experienced, you, there might be some patients who are not very nice. But on the other hand, you get a lot of nice feedback when you see yeah, we've done this technique. For example, we did a publication on, on it's called full functional length of the research technique. Um, where we change the way of approaching the apex during the radical prostatectomy. And then with the PROMS, we could see that indeed this change uh, of, of surgical technique led to earlier continence. And we discussed it in our group and took over this uh, technique and this variation of apical approach. And I think that is very stimulating for, for you um, uh, as, as a surgeon to, yeah, to improve. And it's like a constant process, actually. Then another question by John Dolosel. Hope I, I again pronounce your name right. Do you think that PROMS should be organized by a third party? Very good question. Very good question. I don't know whether it should be organized. I think, first of all, to be, to be realistic, um, is there someone who would do that in your, in your situation? I don't know which country you are. You, uh, you're living in, uh, if, you, if there is a third party, I think yes, because it might, it might make it more, um, let's say, um, less subjective. Certainly everyone has the, the idea or the fear if someone is taking up his own data. Um, you know, it might be different if a third party is doing that. So ideally, I would say yes. Uh, we have done studies like that, I can tell you, and um, 
But on the other hand, if you have the prompts, the prompts are if you send to a patient, it's a standardized way of answering. So the patient should, I think that's pretty much the truth, should you know, give you the questionnaire um, back in the same way you would give it to a third party. Okay, any further questions from your side? If that is not the case, Oh, regards from Mohamed Khalil, thank you very much. Um, Sophie de Bear, what kind of program do you use for data registration? I think of REDCap, uh, are there others? Yes, there are certainly others. Um, what we are using is a FileMaker program. We actually program that on our own. We developed this in the years and we're using that, but there are um, now um, Databases that allow application. It's one of it's, it's by Philips, one um, program that we just implementing. We've just bought that because we want to get away from our homemade way, which is actually working nice due to all these um, uh, data restrictions that we see now to like an official company um, uh, supporting our, our databases. We have not yet implemented, we're just trying these things out, but we actually have programmed that. Whatever database you can use, use it. So we have another couple of minutes and uh, another question from Dr. Yamamoto. Do you feel prompts should be made publicly available to patients for each institution? Yes. Absolutely, the, the, absolutely. And I think this is just a question of time. And I told you about this uh, prostate cancer outcome trial uh, and the reduce of variation. And um, that is the idea of the whole thing that you, um, that you, that the patient is put into the situation that he can compare. Certainly it's very delicate to put that on your homepage, um, especially when data are collected by, by a third party um, and so it must be, and I told you that and I showed you that it must be uh, stratified. For example, you know, more advanced cancer, they have worse uh, potency rates, so it must be definitely stratified. But I think you should do that. I may say that we in our Martin Kling, we're putting our data on the homepage. And uh, so patients can, can judge that and get a, 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 let's say, realistic expectation. I think that's good for you. Give patients a realistic expectation because uh, I think that's a very important thing to make them happy and satisfied. If, if you're giving unrealistic expectations, it's very difficult to, to make your patient happy. And the other thing that we saw as well that um, this way of making your data transparent attracts patients. And uh, therefore, yeah, I can only recommend to you as your own initiative to put your data on your homepage. And on the other hand, I think with the PCO trial now, the data are connected and comparable. Um, I'm not sure whether it will be published. I don't, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it will not be published institution-wise at this moment in time because data analysis are, are ongoing and discussions about the consequences and so forth, but, but I think it, it will be published. And we've just had yesterday a, a German initiative, as I said, the German government is now implementing quality criteria and we just decided on those. It's unfortunately not based on the prompts, it's rather on process things, but um, the, the plan is if hospitals don't fulfill this quality criteria in the future, it's just at the beginning of implementing that, it will have a consequence for the hospital. So I think you should better be taking the lead in, in these things and, and take care of your own patient series, use the prompts, they are officially recognize the action criteria. You will learn a lot about yourself and, and your, your surgery and uh, I can only highly recommend to, to get that started. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Um, we are at the end. I just thank you for your, yeah, for listening to me and for, I hope you, you got something out of that and find it interesting. As I said, um, I hope I, I gave the talk in the way that you could uh, answer the CME questions. You will get a mail of that tomorrow. 
And um, yeah, I thank you very much. I hope you have a nice evening. I say goodbye from Hamburg and hope to see you soon in real life. Bye-bye.